local multiplier effects in Lancaster, Autonomics in New Zealand, and of course the Trade Credit Clubs and Credit Commons, which Dill will speak about shortly. And within the group, we take inspiration from network science, complexity theory, agent-based modeling, and of course, real world examples such as Sardex. Uh, and whilst most of our work is in the early stages of development, every now and then we will be hosting events like this, uh, where we present robust findings that deepen our understanding of circular economies based on mutual credit. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we're delighted to have assembled such a large and sophisticated audience to give Tom Ash's work the attention it deserves. Um, and I'll be hosting the Q&A at the end of the talk. So please put your questions in the chat and I'll collect them and put them to Tom Ash. Uh, we hope you enjoy the talk and it will be the first of many. Back to you, Dil. Thanks, Tom. Uh, last summer, Mutual Credit Services developed a framing of two mechanisms, a continuous clearing and mutual credit which brought them both together in the context of the Credit Commons Ledger Protocol. We call this a trade credit club. This framing is designed to appeal to all sorts of small trading organizations, businesses, and social enterprises cooperatives. We knew that we could communicate the benefits of coming together in mutual agreement to manage means of exchange liquidity in groups of trading partners. What we couldn't do was quantify or analyze this effect robustly. So when only a couple of months later, we were introduced to the paper you're about to hear a presentation of, it was as if all our birthday presents had come on the same day, which makes us very pleased to be able to bring you Tomas Fleischmann, author, along with Paolo Dini, who's here today, and Giuseppe Litera, who I don't think is, of that paper. Thomas Fleischmann, whose degree was in computer science and who also has an MBA, is a computer systems and logic engineer at consultancy firm B Solutions in Slovenia. His career started at IBM as an e-business evangelist, after which he was director of internet services with Telemac, a successful startup, and then CEO of a trading company. Tomas has been with B Solutions since 2004 He's active as a senior consultant there in sales, strategy, project and change management, and manufacturing. He's currently specializing in trade credit and liquidity saving mechanisms, bringing his broad industry and business experience into the development of monetary and payment systems. I'll hand over to Tomas now, but before I do, I'd like to make a couple of practical points. Firstly, we are recording this session. Thank you very much to Theo for reminding me that we were planning to do that. I've turned it on. And we'll also be using a transcription service and hopefully we'll have a reasonably good quality transcription. Um, anyone who doesn't want to be recorded or would like to be excised from any recording, please let us know. Um, any of you that don't mind being recorded, Thomas would be grateful if you would keep your video on during the presentation. Uh, he likes to see some human faces as long, alongside his slides. And lastly, just to reiterate, because we've got so many people, um, we're doing written questions only to try and get as many questions in as we can. Um, so please put your questions in the chat. Um, but don't be worried. Tomash has made a brave commitment he's going to give written answers to any question that's written in the chat and we will post them in the discussion forum on the meetup. So even if your question doesn't get answered live because you've written it down, it will generate a response. Anyway, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tom Ash. Okay, thank you very much, Dil. Um, hello everyone, thanks for attending in such a big number. So my name is Tomas Fleischmann. So the paper presenting today written by me, uh, Paolo Dini and Giuseppe Littera uh, was uh, published in Journal of Risk and Financial Management. And um, when we've written it, uh, we didn't know what to expect, but uh, the first response from the magazine was was great, so we, we were chosen as a cover 
for the magazine, and this was already the first sign that uh, there will be a lot of uh, interest for this article, and uh, it, it proved to be to be uh, right. So uh, I had many discussions with uh, various people about this paper, and uh, it's a broad, very broad paper, and uh, it turns out that uh, the major obstacle for, for the understanding uh, is the liquidity saving mechanism. So not, not many people really know what liquidity saving uh, means. So uh, for this presentation, I decided to, to go a little bit down to earth and to start with a theme that is very close uh, to, to everyone, I think. And this would, this would be the late payment. So what do we know about um, the late payment? So it's, uh, first of all, it's um, somehow connected, associated with bad emotions. And uh, this goes for the both sides. So Bayer might get, might have to break his piggy bank uh, to be able to pay. And he uh, might, uh, might be forced to do the same because he didn't get paid and he doesn't have money to pay, to pay further. So, I think this is an emotion that everyone can relate to in private life or in business. Uh, it, it's quite often that we have this situation looking at the broken piggy bank. So this uh, impact of the late payment is very, very broad. So, and uh, it, it is uh, in interest of any society to, to build an environment that is good for investment, that is good for growth, uh, uh, that is good for small companies, for social enterprises, and uh, so that everyone has uh, sufficient access uh, to finance. So late payments and accumulated debt uh, that is associated with the late payments is very often the primary reason that limits the growth of these companies. So in many cases, it even forces them to go out of business. So the late payments uh, are really important uh, thing to avoid since they, as I, I have pointed out here in, in these points, uh, they cause uh, higher costs, they deplete, deplete cash reserves, uh, there are high administrative costs, uh, lower productivity. Uh, it's a distraction from the normal business. It creates losses in the businesses uh, that would otherwise be profitable. So uh, it places the financial burden of the uh, financing on the smallest companies in the supply chains. Uh, it causes unemployment, it, it destroys firms and it creates all kinds of barriers uh, to entry. So it is really worth uh, working against uh, the late payment. So to put some numbers on this, understand what late payment really is. Let's look at the situation in the UK, since UK is kind of a hosting country for this event. Uh, so the situation in other countries is more or less comparable. So what do we have here? We have here a chart from the European payment report for the last year. Uh, right on top, you see a chart that shows the gap in payment terms offered and the actual payment duration. But you can see that in uh, UK and uh, in Europe in general, and also elsewhere in the world, uh, there is a significant gap between the, uh, what is offered as a payment term and what, what is then achieved. And this goes uh, for the consumer business, for business to business, and also for the uh, public administrations. So in the middle graph, what you see is um, answers how many businesses uh, had to accept uh, a longer payment term than uh, they feel comfortable with. And here again, you see that uh, the numbers, the percentages are very high. Only 11% uh, of the companies uh, feel they, they were not threatened by, by the late payment. And uh, the biggest, uh, pressure is coming from a large multinational corporation. So they, the large multinationals are those who pay the worst. And on the bottom, uh, you see the answers to question, uh, how is your sentiment about the late payment? 
and you see a, a huge degradation of the situation in, in last year, of course, due to, because of the COVID crisis. So this late payment is a really huge problem at, at this moment. So what do we do? So uh, we have here a, a chart. This chart uh, is uh, prepared by the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. And it is part of their material to help companies uh, manage the problem. And um, to manage something, you have to understand it. So this chart is defining the, the causes for the late payment. And here you see uh, four main uh, causes. So the tactical, beyond the re regulatory or good practice threshold, uh, outside of agreed payment terms, and the default risk. So then you have, of course, all kinds of combinations of these causes in right in the middle with the number 13. It's basically a, a criminal offense. So somebody is trying to, to get something from you and he never intended to pay anyway. And this is definitely one you, you want to avoid. So from my practice, uh, I see the development of, um, of this is usually like this. So there is a tactical reason, and this tactical reason might be very simple, like um, uh, dividends have to be paid off, or uh, maybe there is some investment, or it can be that uh, the general manager wants to buy a new Mercedes Benz. Anyway, he needs money, and uh, where do I get it? Okay, we will delay the payment, and this is, and then you you demand from your suppliers something that is beyond regulatory or good practice threshold. And because, of course, they don't agree, you go a step further, forward and uh, what happens is you, you, you end up here. You are actually not paying, uh, although it was not agreed. And uh, this is a situation uh, where there is already a litigation uh, uh, problem. So, and uh, to litigate this is, is, this is a very expensive way to resolve the situation. On the other side, if you are small, what happens is uh, you are poorly financed anyway, uh, because you are small. And um, then you, you, you were not paid by, because of some tactical decisions. Uh, you cannot pay, uh, you come in this area outside of a green uh, payment terms and uh, because nothing changes, you simply advance into the next stage. Uh, okay, so now you are uh, outside of all uh, legal limits and again, the solution looks like uh, it will be a uh, litigation. So, what what is the problem with this uh, with this uh, scheme so everything uh, ends up with the litigation this is one problem and the other problem with this chart is uh, there is no definition uh, of systemic reasons why is this uh, happening and this is what we are going to look uh, for next so the main reason systemic reason for all these happenings is something called gridlock and I will go slowly with you so that you can all understand what gridlock is. So here, to, to explain it, we have a small obligations network. So what we have uh, nodes, and nodes represent firms, and we have edges. The edges represent obligations. This can be payment obligations to pay whatever, invoice tax, it doesn't really matter. And uh, the numbers uh, on the edges are the values. Okay, so this is a small uh, obligation uh, network. Uh, there is no money in, in here. There are just promises that something uh, that we owe something. These are just IOUs. And uh, you will see that uh, this obligation network has an interesting property. It's called uh, net internal debt, and net internal debt of this obligation network is exactly one. And that means that you only need one unit of whatever, money, tokens, doesn't matter what, to clear all the obligations in this, uh, in this obligation network. So let's look how this uh, goes. So we add 
to the obligation network um, a special note. This note, uh, I call it a liquidity source. So this note has a property that it can hold uh, the accounts, holding accounts for all the firms in the obligation network. So here V0 v as a liquidity source holds uh, one unit uh, uh, for the company B1. And uh, when, when the transactions go through, this one unit will come back to the liquidity source as one unit. So basically what happens in the payment system is uh, everything is coming back. So bank, um, mutual credit society, so whatever. Basically what happens is just a unit of account is moving from one account to another. So it's basically going nowhere. And uh, the net internal depth of such a system is zero. So uh, that means uh, the system is perfectly balanced. If you look at every node in this system, you will see whatever comes in goes out. So the, the net, uh, the net uh, of every node is zero. And what is interesting is that even this system looks like perfect. So we need one unit and everything gets paid. But in the real life, this does not happen. So what is going on? So firms are acting as uh, independent agents and uh, they don't perform uh, the activities at once, but in a sequence. And here the only uh, logical beginning is, okay, uh, company V1 uh, takes uh, money from the bank and pays. So now we have one at V2, but here is already a problem. So V2 now has one unit, but needs to pay two, doesn't have the money. So what, ha what must happen is uh, he must take a loan from the liquidity source. So he needs an additional uh, one to pay. So now he can pay two and uh, these payments of one and one from V3, V5 can go through. Uh, V3 can return the, the money back to the liquidity source. And also V2 is now uh, has additional uh, unit and he can repay the short term loan and the final situation is uh, like this. Uh, the, the unit of account uh, is, is there safely on the uh, V4 uh, account um, and uh, all the debts are cleared. So the obligation, the obligation network is clear, does not exist anymore. And this is just one of the possible solutions. So actually there are, uh, there are uh, more solutions. But because we had to go into the, into the liquidity source and take more money, more, more liquidity to solve the problem, this is why this is called the gridlock situation. But the solutions are many. So in this case, any company in this circle could break the piggy bank, okay? So even for example, if a company V3 would decide to, to break uh, the gridlock, uh, it would go, but then uh, it depends. So if they pay uh, V5, the gridlock is uh, resolved. If they would pay uh, company V4, the gridlock would remain. So uh, as you see, these uh, circular patterns in, in the obligation network are, are a source of risk. If they are not resolved, and if you leave um, companies to, to resolve their debts in, in, in sequence or what, on how they want to, you, you risk uh, a non-payment or you risk a gridlock uh, situation. And there are plenty of circles. So this is a very common situation. So what is then the solution? The solution is, that firms simply start to collaborate, okay? So uh, what you have to do, you have to share 
the information. This is this is important uh, thing. Everyone has to share the information about their obligations. Once this is done, we can do the following. We can identify the cycles, the cyclic patterns in the obligation network. When you identify a cyclic pattern, you can do a multilateral set of so here we have done multilateral set of the obligations from v3 to v5 and from v5 to uh, v2 are uh, are gone and the obligation from v2 to v3 is diminished to one and what we have now is a very simple solution so this one unit of account can travel freely without any gridlock through the remaining network so basically what you have seen in this small Example is that if you remove cyclic uh, patterns out of obligation networks, you are basically reducing the risk. This is the first effect. And the second effect is uh, that no one really has to break his piggy bank. And uh, not breaking a piggy bank, this, this, uh, this means the liquidity saved. So, Let's now look how this looks uh, in, a, in a big uh, system. So we have um, an example here from Japan. So I have chosen this one because it's a very modern one. It's uh, relatively recent. Uh, it started operating in 2015, if I remember correctly. Um, and it is an example of a modern uh, real-time gross settlement system that has a so-called hybrid solution. So they, they do everything. They do all tricks. And uh, the, the central feature of this payment system is uh, this centralized queue in, in the middle. So what happens? Uh, the payment instructions from companies are or basically from banks, because the members of uh, the, the systems are mainly banks and some big companies. So the payment instructions are coming in and they do the test for bilateral offsetting uh, with uh, all, the, all the payments orders already in queue. And if, if they can offset, they say, okay, it's successful. Um, we clear the thing. Uh, if not, uh, the payment remains in the queue. And then from the time from time to time, they do the multilateral offsetting. The multilateral offsetting, that means finding the cycles, okay? So uh, at this point, I would like to remind you that there are many ways to find cycles. So I have studied uh, the published algorithms for multilateral offsetting used in real-time gross settlement systems. And I can tell you that they are not even close as efficient as, as the algorithm that we used to analyze uh, Sardex. And the reason is very simple. They, it doesn't need to be uh, so efficient because uh, in general, uh, these real-time gross settlement systems are flooded with uh, liquidity and uh, th there is no such pressing need for, for, uh, for a, a really optimized uh, solution. So this is how, how they do it. And um, let's look at the effects now. So the effects uh, of this, this is published uh, by the Bank of Japan for this system are basically two, two key effects. One is the reduction of settlement exposures. That means whatever liquidity is available in the system to clear the payments, uh, the, the payments go through much faster if the liquidity saving features are used. Okay? And uh, the other uh, benefit of this is that you, you, you enhance the resilience against the liquidity shocks. So with a given liquidity, you see that the slope of the curve is uh, much lower and this basically means uh, lower risks. So you can also notice with uh, these uh, graphs that there are no, uh, no numbers here. So, and uh, I will, there is, I think it's a good reason why not. 
but I will give you some uh, explanations about uh, the numbers. So uh, regarding settlement times, basically uh, real-time gross settlement system try to, to do this in real time, as the name suggests. Practically, this means within uh, the same day. Um, the fastest uh, settlement times today are achieved in target. This target is uh, European, uh, main, main European real-time gross settlement systems. Uh, the transactions there take five seconds. This is the fastest. For example, in Switzerland, they have uh, 12 seconds. But uh, there are always some transactions that are late and there are procedures to, uh, to make sure that everything goes through uh, within one day. So the, the longest uh, transactions uh, might wait for hours in, 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 this, in this system. Uh, regarding liquidity, I will provide you now with some numbers, okay? So uh, what we see here is a report uh, from uh, UK, since UK is the hosting uh, country. And this is daily volume. So it's not monthly or uh, this is daily volume of transactions in the real-time growth settlement system. And as you can see, this is comparable with uh, the amount of money issued. So. Uh, daily daily traffic is uh, one third of all money issued, more or less, and this is also one third of GDP. For example, if you, if you want, uh, it's a really big number, and the, one of the reasons is that CHEPS uh, is, uh, I think, it's the second largest real-time gross settlement system anyway, and uh, in this number there are all kind of transactions uh, happening in the financial world. And the number is big and it looks completely de decoupled from the real economy. And basically it is. And now uh, I would like to invite you to imagine the size of the piggy bank. So, um, and uh, maybe you will understand why uh, Bank for International Settlements and, and, and all the central banks are keeping such a close eye on, on, on this system, because if anything goes wrong here, it's re it, it really is too big to fail. So I, I can't, there is no such piggy bank to solve this. But yet, what we can learn from this is that banks collaborate to manage liquidity. So they collaborate, they share information. They put all information into a central system and they use the information to manage the risk. And this is something that companies, uh, small companies do not do, but it's not necessarily so. So in Slovenia, we did it. We are doing it for 30 years and even more. And uh, I will, uh, we will look now how this works in, in Slovenia, this cooperation. So I'm giving you here a chart. Um, when we started to, to run uh, the system, so that the, the chart starts in the year 1991. So Bill told me that, uh, that the description of this chart is very dry in the article. So maybe I, could, I should give some juicy details. Uh, so in 91, uh, what happened was the war. So we had war for independence. Uh, it, this was uh, late spring, early summer. Uh, first international recognitions of independence came uh, around Christmas. In between, businesses were left uh, more or less to, to, to our own. So we didn't have, um, we, 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 had, we published our own money, but it was not really convertible. So. Basically, we had a complementary currency running because uh, it was even printed on, on, on a paper like with a laser printer. So it's, it was really strange. And um, for all practical reasons, uh, Slovenian dollar at that point was a complementary currency to Deutschmark. 
And the behavior of the people would be, if you get a Slovenian dollar, you go to the black market and, and buy as much uh, Deutschmark as possible. And businesses were doing uh, the same. So a lot of businesses uh, had opened accounts in, in Austria and so on. So the situation was really uh, bad in terms of uh, the design and condition of the monetary system. And for that reason, of course, the debt and the late payment problem was huge. So being paid in three months or six months was nothing special. And this is uh, what you see with the blue line on this uh, graph. So uh, the reported uh, unpaid invoices were half of the GDP. But the system provided some relief. So uh, 7.58% uh, of, of the obligations were cleared in the multilateral uh, set -off. So this is, a, I think, a very big contribution that helped a lot to, to sail through these uh, troubled times. The other interesting thing of uh, this chart is that it ends in 1949. And uh, it's an it's a interesting story. So the agency running uh, the solution for the, for the companies uh, was reporting directly to the parliament. So uh, we have a public record from Parliament uh, where all the, the results were published publicly and are still available publicly. But then in 1995, the agency went under the government. And because of that, uh, the results were not public anymore. And uh, so I didn't publish them in, in the article because nobody would be able to check because we need a special arrangement to access these archives. And uh, so on the next slide, you will see, uh, we start with year 2002. And this is uh, because the agency was then uh, established as an independent agent agency. It is in, in public uh, property, but um, so it's a public uh, uh, agency owned by, by the state, but it's not uh, dependent on the government anymore. And uh, the results were public again, so that we can see this chart. So what else we can see on this chart is that the system uh, sailed through the troubled times and uh, we were more and more successful. The need to use the system uh, was diminished because there were less and less uh, late, late payment problems. But then in the crisis, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, you see some interesting developments. So first, uh, uh, what is interesting is that uh, the late payment problem was increased, but not so much. But the success of, uh, of the clearing of the multilateral set off uh, was diminished. And the reason for this is that the density of the network, so the amount of, uh, of businesses among the players on the market was uh, diminished. So what we have here uh, is uh, less, less multilateral set off because the network was uh, kind of smaller. But then when the growth started again, what happened is uh, you have a denser network but uh, also uh, the companies are in poor condition after the crisis. Uh, there's no, not enough liquidity and the, the unpaid uh, problem uh, ballooned. And uh, you can see the similar, the similar is happening now with this COVID crisis. So again, we see uh, the, the late payment problem is growing, but the success of multilateral set off is not yet because there is less less business around so every a lot of lockdown clo closures and uh, there is the density of uh, of the network is diminished so we can expect in next years uh, a similar development once we get out of the lockup uh, the businesses will start running again and uh, they will be generally everyone will be without money so the late payment problem will, will balloon again and, uh, but because the network, the obligation network will be denser for sure, there will be more 
business, the success of uh, the, the multilateral set of will be bigger. The other thing is that uh, not every company in Slovenia uh, joins the system around, we have a participation of around 5%. It's not big, it should be bigger. And uh, the other thing in Slovenia as a small economy is not a good, good uh, playground for this system because uh, around 80% of our GDP is uh, achieved via export. So, and when you do import export, uh, you, you cannot clear, uh, you cannot close the cycles within the national economy if you do import export. So, with uh, in 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 countries uh, that have uh, that are less dependent on on export, you would get much better success. So, we did some trials in in Italy, and. Uh, it is it is much better than, than in Slovenia. Um, 